Okay. Well, I want to thank all of you so much for coming out for this celebration of life for Reuben Jackson. Um, I know without having to, I know we are all feeling uh, the same love for Reuben. And um, we've been planning this and so much more uh, since his passing. And um, we're so thrilled to have pulled this together and to have all of you here. Uh, our initial idea was to create a program where we could all share in, uh, in our love of Ruben. Uh, including grieving or uh, all of our uh, emotions and love for him. Um, and in honor of Ruben, uh, his love of music and poetry and fellowship, uh, we have put together a fantastic program of fabulous artists, uh, musicians and poets, uh, who will join us today. And in the jazz tradition, uh, both for the living and the past, uh, this is a group participatory experience. Call and response. Uh, so feel free to engage. Just pretend for the next period of time that we're not New Englanders. <laughs> and allow yourself to feel the joy and express it. Um, so, uh, okay, amen. Yes. I, I'm, every time I perform myself, I try to come up with creative, nice ways to say what I just said. <laughs> so I'm glad that, that that is working. Okay, uh, now I would like to invite the uh, event organizers to come up and uh, just say a bit on Ruben and uh, putting this program together. I'd like to invite Molly Stone and Jacob Peltier yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, where are they? Okay. Well, I'll keep it short and sweet and just echo what Toussaint said and thank you all for being here. Um, as many of you know, this is a labor of love and love is going to be filling this building today. Um, and we have the exciting book launch of Ruben as well. So. Um, he'll be able to live with us long afterwards as well. So thank you all for being here, and here's Molly as well. I will also keep it short. My name is Molly Stone, um, good friend of Ruben's. I've been imagining this day for a long, long time, and it's looking exactly like I was imagining. So I'm very, very grateful for all of you being here and to have this celebration. Uh, I, I'm. I'm sandwiched between two very good friends of mine, so that makes me feel even better about it. I do have a message that I would like to give you from the folks that organized the Reuben Jackson Poetry Prize. Uh, you'll hear more information about that. In fact, I've got handouts downstairs that you can take along with you that has all the information about the Poetry Prize project uh, and how you can donate to it and more information about how it's, or just behind the project itself. So. Here is the message. Dear Reuben Jackson Memorial organizers, friends, and companions, we celebrate the life and legacy of beloved Reuben Jackson with you today, and we thank you for organizing this beautiful memorial. Losing Reuben was a huge blow, but sharing the marvelous legacy of his poetry, his contributions to music, and his in indefatigable, what a brilliant word, and act, Humanity helps ensure that future generations can enjoy his many gifts. Reuben Jackson, we love you. Mariana McDonald and Melissa Tucky, who are the co-chairs of the Reuben Jackson Poetry Prize Project. So thank you to them.
And I will echo two songs, uh, and not that you need an invitation to do this, but I'll give you one more invitation to be like Ruben when he was in the audience for any event. I can see some of you nodding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And tissues are nearby if you need your tissues, as he, he had stock in Kleenex. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm going to pass it back to Toussaint. And uh, again, thank you. Okay. So now, excuse me, uh, I want to introduce uh, one of our great Vermont publishers. Uh, I'm so pleased that in all the developments of the arts of Vermont, we now have publishers. Um, you know, we, we don't have to, we don't have to go to New York for anything. We got it all right here. Uh, and one of our great publishers is Samantha Kobler. Uh, who has Rootstock Publishing, and um, her most recent book, which she's debuting today, is Ruben Jackson's, I'm still getting used to saying last book, but uh, his wonderful book of poems, it is absolutely wonderful. Um, and the book will be on sale downstairs during the reception. So after the program, go down, buy a copy. Uh, buy all of them, because uh, this will definitely be a hot book. Uh, Ruben and I both signed with Rootstock uh, around the same time. And we, had, we were excited about uh, touring our books together, which uh, I would still like to try to do in some fashion. Uh, my, my book of poems will be coming out in October, but we can talk about that some other time. Uh, so now I want to introduce Samantha. Thank you, Toussaint, and congrats on your upcoming book. Um, please look out for it in October. We have a mailing list downstairs. You're welcome to sign it um, to get more information about it. So thank you. Um, hello, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you to the organizers, Vermont Humanities, uh, Vermont Arts Council, uh, Catamount Arts for organizing. This is just really a, a wonderful day to come together and celebrate Ruben. Yay for the arts! Yay! Um, so I am Samantha Colber. I'm the publisher at Rootstock Publishing, and I'm also a poet, and uh, more importantly, was a friend of Ruben's. Uh, it's hard to recall when we first met, because Ruben was one of those friends that you just felt like you'd known him your whole life. Um, that's how deep he would connect with people. Uh, we bonded over Goddard College. We were both alumni. Uh, and over Bear Pond Books, which was one of his favorite places on earth. I used to work there for many years. He shared a, uh, a funny story of when he graduated from Goddard, he went to apply for a job at Bear Pond. And he was thrilled because it was his favorite place and he was such a book nerd. And when he told his mother about it, uh, rather than be excited for him, as excited as he was, she exclaimed something like, we sent you to college to sell books in Vermont? <laughs> and, and she was right. He was destined for more than retail. Um, so, <laughs> go mom. Um, I'd like to share something, a short poem that I wrote on the night he died. Because like many poets, I reach for my journal uh, when I need to process life and death. And Ruben's loss was, and still is, too big to process. But what else is a poet going to do than put words to the page? February 16th. I'm writing this in the literal dark because it's the dead of night and it's Vermont. Twelve hours ago, my friend died. My tears are like sap and take a while to flow. It feels too ridiculous to lose this poet from this earth. But who knows what happens when we die? For all we know, Reuben is in a better place, a good place, with musical notes on the wind, poems in the clouds. 
with no one following a brother's back, and he wouldn't want us to cry for that. So then really when I'm crying, I'm crying for myself and for the way I'll miss his voice, his hugs, his old school voicemails, and the way he would laugh and say, oh Lord, while looking up at the sky. So this is a good uh, segue to introduce his book. My Specific Awe and Wonder, which as you can see, and you'll see downstairs when you come, um, the cover is full of clouds. This is a picture that he sent to me back in December with a simple email that just said, cover, question mark. And the answer, of course, was yes. Um, this book was in progress since he signed with Rootstock in November of 2023. He was thrilled to sign with a Vermont publisher uh, for these, what he called, poems and whatnot. <laughs> so humble. Uh, as he referred to them, and he, and he also called this a love letter to Vermont with all the potholes visible. And um, by that, you know, he refers to the poems about being a black man in a predominantly white state. There was a, a recent article in The Seven Days um, about this book and about those poems that really highlights the juxtaposition of the love he felt for Vermont and the alienation he felt here. Um, check out that article. Um, it was very hard to decide to move forward with this book after he died, but it was also harder to think of these poems languishing rather than being savored and shared. So I reached out to his partner, Janae Michelle. Uh, she gave her blessing to publish the book, and she also sent some handwritten drafts of poems that Reuben had been working on. They, uh, they were on his desk. Um, they're in the book in the back section in a draft section. But other than that, um, the first few sections are what Reuben sent and said, here's the, the layout for the book, and he had it all uh, laid out in the way he wanted it. Um, so thank you to Janae. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who offered words of praise and in tribute to Reuben in the book. Um, there's a praise page and also some on the back. Thank you to Abdul Ali, L.N. Bathia, Rajni Edens, Major Jackson, Rose Solari, Toussaint St. Negritude, and Christopher Kaufman Elstrup. Uh, I'm going to give a special thanks to my graphic designer. He's a book format matter named Eddie Vincent from Farmington, Maine. Uh, he helped produce this book with integrity, keeping Reuben's wishes and aesthetic in mind. And it was Eddie's idea to scan in Reuben's handwritten poems so that you can see his handwriting along with the poems. Um, it's quite beautiful. So yes, have Kleenex. <laughs> Uh, another thank to all the poets and speakers and musicians who keep his spirit alive in performance and remembrance. Um, I'd also uh, like to mention again that we'll have books for sale downstairs. Proceeds from the sale of this work will benefit a scholarship in his name at the University of the District of Columbia for students interested in poetry and jazz. And we're also donating to the Reuben Jackson Poetry Prize at Howard University, uh, which is part of the Academy of American Poets college prizes program and it supports creative writing at a historically black college um, so i think ruben would be especially proud about that um, he, he would definitely um, he would definitely be so pleased that his legacy is helping young black poets thrive so thank you in advance for your support i'm going to close with a poem from the book uh, that to me is kind of classic ruben um, it's funny and reverent and full of love. It's called Long Distance Love. A friend sends a picture of three chickens standing in a kind of formation on a road where the snow has begun to retreat. Funny, I tell her. I was humming the theme from Green Acres last evening and thinking about people who move to rural places in search of serenity while also yearning for a Trader Joe's. <laughs> As for myself, I remain smitten with mountains majestic but unpretentious, and the way rural silence calms me like Miles Davis playing a ballad, a serenity 
my friend says he finds in the ever-changing sky. Thank you so much. Uh, absolutely wonderful. And uh, throughout the program, we'll have a few people reading some of the poems from the book there. Um, so our next performer is uh, a fantastic pianist, composer, uh, former professor at Goddard, and a longtime friend of Rubens, Otto Muller. Um, Otto's going to come up and play, I believe, a composition that he wrote uh, shortly after Rubens' passing, honoring Ruben, a beautiful piece. Thank you, Toussaint. Um, I just wanted to say a, a couple words. Uh, as Toussaint uh, mentions, uh, I was at Goddard for 16 years, and that's where I met Ruben. Um, I met him when he came back to teach at his alma mater in 2010. Um, and I remember he was teaching a workshop on Miles Davis and the poetics of transformation. Um, we, uh, we nerded out about Ahmad Jamal and Puccini, um, and I found, so I, I'd studied music for my, my whole life, I've been in school for music, but I feel like Ruben taught me what it means to love music, um, to care for it with honest, selfless, vulnerable, and passionate love. Um, and I learned a lot from, from the honesty of Ruben's love, uh, his love for Vermont never shied away from its pointed critique of Vermont's pervasive, casual racism. It was a love that never lost its edge, but never lost its softness either. Um, always attentive to the immense amount of work to be done, and to the need to hear each other, to hold each other, to hold each other accountable in that work. And he could do that with such grace, uh, with the wit of his turns of phrase, the meaning of those deliberate pauses, the things that he left unsaid. Um, so after I heard about Rubin's passing, uh, I spent the afternoon with the old Steinway in the Hay Barn Theater at Goddard College, uh, a piano that I know knew Rubin well. Um, and so uh, in reverence to the spontaneous musical elegies of, of Charles Mingus and others, uh, me and the piano spent some time remembering Ruben together, um, and I, I'd like to share something that we came up with.
Absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, the next program I'd like to introduce, uh, we have a video uh, put together by a local Vermont choir. Uh, you know, in putting this together, I was really just thinking of Ruben, I mean, obviously, but thinking of, you know, the, the things Ruben loved and, uh, as you all know, listen to his program on VPR, Ruben loved a wide range of music, including Aretha. And I had no qualms with him playing Aretha or Earth, Wind and Fire on a jazz show. It made perfect sense to me. As I know, it would make perfect sense to Maurice White of Earth, Wind and Fire, and it would make perfect sense to uh, Mingus or anyone else, but um, Ruben was a big fan of Aretha's uh, gospel album, Amazing Grace, and the film that came out a few years ago. Uh, so I couldn't get Aretha, <laughs> uh, and I tried to get some sort of choir, and a local choir called the Freedom and Unity Choir, um, and I know you all are familiar with that state motto, and uh, they were hoping to physically be here and perform, but because the elevator was out, uh, 
they weren't able to come. But they very kindly, beautifully, as you'll see, put together just a short video of the choir singing some songs, specifically sung for Reuben. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm still new to this. So uh, here's a member of the choir, Beth. Hi. Um, as Susan has explained, we really wanted to be here. We kind of planned to be here, but it turns out that the floods wiped out the elevator and it doesn't work. And uh, you'll see from our video, hey Deb, another member of our choir, um, uh, you'll see from our video that our director uses a wheelchair and some of the other members of the choir as well, or the chorus we call it, um, have mobility issues. So they're, they're all here in spirit, they're watching the live stream, but um, we, we had a great, it was a great honor to put these four songs together. Thanks.
mothers of the movement who became advocates for police reform after losing their children to police violence. Today we include Ruben in this litany of social justice warriors. <laughs> Thank you. 
Carl Rubin was his deep love for a diverse range of music, including classical. Our final song we would like to share with you today comes from Antonin Dvorak's Ninth Symphony, composed in 1893 while he served as the director of the American National Conservatory of Music. His From the New World Symphony included themes from Native American and African American musical traditions, mixed with American folk music and folk music of his country, Bohemia. His student, William Arms Fisher, added words to the second movement in the style of an African American spiritual. His arrangement, titled Going Home, was played during the funeral procession for President Franklin Roosevelt. It also was sung by the great bass baritone Paul Robeson at Carnegie Hall in 1958. Dear Reuben, thank you for sharing your gifts with us. While your song has ended, your melody reverberates in the hearts of all who knew you. Rest in power.
Thank you so much to the Freedom and Unity Chorus. So now, before uh, we go into our next uh, musical performance, I want to introduce Shimi Bangura, who uh, is going to bless the room. Uh, going to bless the room and our ancestors, who Ruben has now joined. Uh, Shimi will uh, play the drum. Getting set up, I'd like to have um, a friend read. We have a wonderful proclamation from the state of Vermont. And uh, I think it'll be nice to hear it read out loud. So Rick is going to try and lend my voice to this endeavor and sound steakhousey. <laughs> Concurrent House Resolution 175. 
House Concurrent Resolution in Memory of Jazz Aficionado, Ruben Jackson. I'm not going to read the names of all the people who sponsored it, but I will count them real quick. Over 50 people signed on. Only over 50 representatives signed on to this resolution. Whereas Ruben Jack Jackson's contributions to the annals of jazz were noteworthy and whereas Reuben Jackson was born in Georgia, spent his youth in the nation's capital, and in 1975 arrived in Vermont to attend Goddard College. And whereas, in addition to studying writing at Goddard, Reuben Jackson inaugurated his broadcasting career working as a DJ at WGDR, the college's radio station, discovering a love for radio, for the radio medium. <laughs> and streaming worldwide on WTBR.org. <laughs> That's not on here. <laughs> Whereas for two decades, Reuben Jackson was honored to work as the curator of the Duke Ellington Collection of the Smithsonian Institution. And whereas his erudite jazz criticism appeared on the airwaves of National Public Radio in the pages of the Washington Post, the Jazz Times and Downbeat Magazine, the All About Jazz website, and whereas years later Reuben Jackson returned to Vermont to teach English at Burlington High School, and in 2012 he was reunited with his passion for radio, hosting Vermont Public, the former Vermont Public Radio's Friday Night Jazz program for six years and recorded from the series are now in the collection of the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. And whereas Reuben Jackson's mentoring at the Young Writers Project reflected both his deep passion for the written word and his life as a respected published poet, and whereas much of his poetry focused on the challenges of the black American experience, and his most recent volume, Scattered Clouds, was issued in 2019. And whereas most recently, Reuben Jackson, who died on February 16th, 2024, at 67 years of age, and is survived by his partner, Janae Michelle, has worked as a jazz archivist at the University of the District of Columbia and served as a radio host at WPFW-FM in Washington, D.C. Now, therefore, be it resolved, by the Senate and House of Representatives that the General Assembly expresses its sincerest condolences to the family of Reuben Jackson and be it further resolved that the Secretary of State be directed to send a copy of this resolution to Janae Michelle, Radio Vermont Public, WPFW Radio, and the Felix E. Grant Jazz Archives at the University of the District of Columbia. Signed, Jill Kronowski, David Zuckerman, and Betsy Ann Rask. Thank you, Brett. And now, Ross will say Everyone who uh, did this, and uh, the Unitarian Church is a uh, very good place to be in general. I do a lot of listening to uh, the choir here, but just very briefly, um, Keith Gibson is you know, drums, a master musician, and educator. Send 
yourself on the next uh, journey. So just, you know, very briefly, uh, I think we met uh, around 1988. I was working in the Strand Bookstore for some time, and then also Amiri Baraka used to have salons in his house in Newark, and I think uh, me and Ruben met there, 88. 89, I think Archie Shepp was there too. He studied with in Massachusetts. And, um, and um, okay, we reconnected uh, from time to time. Uh, I don't know if he was living in New York, but you know, I would see him. And uh, we reconnected here in Vermont very early 2000s. We were in total agreement about Earth and Fire, too. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, great piano composition and for the uh, drum blessing, which was a great opener.
thanks uh, to Harvin uh, Sound System. I know me and Ruben were in the Buke Spiel a lot. <laughs> honor of uh, seeing him. Uh, that wasn't his last performance at the Humanities, was it? His last one? It was his last one. Okay. Yeah, I had the honor of hanging with uh, our other brother, Tucson. Mm -hmm. Bebop song by Bud Powell called The Tempest Future. Time flies. Hey, George, how you doing, brother?
एम आर And there's so much more coming. Wait till we hear Joel. I want to give a, a huge thanks to the musicians and the artists that are performing. These are all brilliant local artists. Please support them. They came here today. No one is getting paid. We did this with very little money. Um, that's why we have cookies downstairs. <laughs> No, actually, we have some really good food downstairs. But uh, this was all done out of love. Uh, but I want to add, support these artists. These, these are regularly performing musicians, regularly performing, publishing poets. Support our artists. Uh, you will see them performing all the time throughout Vermont. Support them. Okay, uh, our next one, yes, support your artists. Um, our next performer is a wonderful poet. Uh, this has just been a dream come true. This is like, like I had this dream last night. I invited all my friends and they all performed. I'm about to lose it. So here we have Ellen Bethea. Tripping, falling on my ass, never learned to double knot my Adidas way. Head in the cloud, Bluetooth smile, just got friended again. Wow, <laughs> proud kind of way. Not today. I'm not looking for approval. Standing in the checkout line, dipping my chip in, showing the powers that be. I am perfectly fine, spending just under my last dime. All eyes anticipate my decline, but my glass is half full. Paper, please keep the receipt. Bags in hand, I'm walking, not waiting for approval. Mm, not today. Been thinking about where I'm at, and that I think therefore I am shit mm, ain't gonna cut it. I'm liking this body, these senses. For years now, been flirting with a half century, eyeballing each other across time for what feels like an eternity. Me and 50, oh, we about to get to know one another. Up close and viscerally. Head up, shoulders back, breasts as high as allowed by the liberation of brawlessness and gravity. <laughs> At my age, a cardinal rule, the body and the mind are tools with which to tease. Got a 50-50 chance of having the transcendental pleasure of being the one brought to my knees. Of course, in the end, I might need a hand getting back up today, <laughs> but not today. Then thinking about where I'm at, weighing the this and the that's. Stats telling me, as a black woman, I've been living the last 17 years as a Negro's ghost. 
In 19 months, her life expectancy, just over 33, that's a couple of years into motherhood for me. In effect, her death, a resurrection into my maternal identity. Senses say, I've got another 28 and a half years of haunting before the African-American woman in me rises to meet her maker once more. But not today. Till then, kinked hair, gray and flabby flesh, fold and wrinkling skin, mapping out all I've known, who I've been. As matron, I claim the crone. Spreading wings of wisdom, set me free. As mother, rooted, bodily bound to the earth could never be. I have flown, negress not needing papers, telling me I am my own. Then, thinking about where I'm at, that place between where I've been and where I have never been, where I am at. I am here, and that is enough today. <laughs> is not the degree of affection I hold for my complexion. Of that, there is no question. Open adoration. Nah, my realities tend to run amok when I complacently lend my voice to a social construct. Repeatedly allowing, repeatedly allowing, repeatedly allowing falsehoods to reoccur. Because lying lips of my own have been known to condone the noir moniker. See, I stand naked before the mirror. She celebrates all of me, and I embrace the whole of her. And from my head's crown on down to my heels that tend to crack, I am wrapped in shades after glorious shades of brown with strategic spatterings of black. It's true, might want to mark it on down as a fact. From the arch of my dark brow, cross my scalp with my grays chasing it on back to my kitchen tangle, I know it, not just think, deep in my pit, on down to my triangle of sun don't shine kink. Only I can use the black on me, again me, to shame or shine, to divide and define. Funny how some folks frown. <laughs> Me, I'm fine. They can't wrap their minds around the fact this black on an abundance of wondrous brown is, if we gonna be exact, all mine. Oh. 
Neighborhoods gone to hell from addiction, deep in debt, the humiliation. Grown children back at home can't pay tuition. Him got problems after problems with no solution. Can't sleep at night must be the tension. No money for the doctor or him prescription. Find some relief from self-medication. Still, him can't catch a break because him Caucasian. Everybody's talking about poor white man. Blames the brown man for his situation. Build a wall nice and tall. Stop immigration. Brown and black, send them back. End the occupation. Move Muslims to a camp of concentration. Put persons of interest to interrogation. Torturism means of getting information. Might is always white. Is him justification for solving all him problems with homogenization. Everybody talking about poor white man, afraid to be the minority of his own nation. Nothing's been the same since desegregation. Life just ain't fair with affirmative action. Woman forgot her place back in the kitchen, and him children exploring their gender identification. Poor white man. But no worries, him got cause for celebration. The rich, angry man with the orange complexion is promising to be him salvation. All him ask from he is genuflection. Everybody talking about poor white man offering up our nation in prostration. That's all it took for two white cops to roll up on a 12-year-old black boy with a toy gun and pop, pop. 
sorrow gives way to anger, because we know it's true. In our great nation, cops take more than a couple of seconds. Mississippi one, Mississippi two, to assess the situation when the child's hair is blonde with eyes of blue. Four minutes alone on the cold ground, gut shot face down, he bled. Four minutes. The cops took the toy gun away. Four minutes. Offered no form of aid or comfort as he lost his life's blood into the snow and mud that day. Four minutes. What must have been going through that dying child's head? At what point did the police understand that he, he was just a boy, not a man, a boy with a toy, not a weapon tucked in his waistband? Our black males are dying, blood running red. Those sworn to serve and protect taking black lives instead. Misinterpretation of the situation is not justification for beating, choking, shooting, the systematic execution of this great nation's unarmed black male population. Wait, clarification. To be male and black in America is to be perceived as a reasonable threat. Whatever you choose to believe, don't be naive. While cops hide behind badges shielded, black lives are cash cashed in, yielded. This great nation has a long, outstanding balance on that debt. Unarmed fathers, unarmed brothers, unarmed Sons. Grief rises to rage when there is no justice to be found. A reasonable people can only be wronged for so long before we decide to burn the whole damned house down, blue walls and all. foreign to my eye and tongue, answering 
unanswerable questions I have asked wind and water for so long. I should have known the water lilies were listening. They were always laughing or whispering secrets to the hunting dragonflies. The cypress trees once waded in knee deep. Great grandmothers soaking the swell from arthritic joints. These elders now stand stunned, their ankles showing. Bare arms raised to the heavens, still given praise. A great blue heron lifts from a puddle left behind by meager rain. Its depth, an illusion. The huge bird rises, mud dripping from wingtips and talons. I tell the heron, I am so sorry. The lake has not been itself of late. I tell the heron, come back again someday, promising there will be fish in the shadows of the lily pads. Sitting on the pier, peering over the edge, feet dangling mid-air with no hope of water. I imagine the laughing spirit of my mother floating on the ghost of the lake. She's humming an unfamiliar tune just at the edge of my hearing. She gives a knowing smile and then absently Drawing circles sends ripples through the phantom surface. Not a lily pad in sight. to invite um, uh, also former host, I believe the original host of Friday Night Jazz uh, on what I still call BPR, <laughs> George Thomas. Call it what you want. <laughs> I've had one cataract attended to with surgery and the other to come, so my balance is way off. Anyway, I'm George Thomas. I did. Uh, 
I did the jazz show on BBR. I still call it BBR. Um, <laughs> for 11 years, and when I wanted to uh, move on, I could think of nobody that qualified as much as Roman Jackson. Here's a guy that was managing the Duke Ellington archives and doing, by all accounts, a fabulous job. He was experienced in radio, the same station where I worked for a while, WGDR. And um, he also loved the Wayside. I mean, I don't think the Wayside has been mentioned yet. But this was a favorite of Ruben's. And uh, I was going to say a lot of things, but uh, I think it's been said already and will be said again. Um, I was asked by a friend who couldn't be here today, Mary Collins, uh, to read a poem she dedicated to Ruben Jackson called Velvet Curtains. I came to speak about the arts, not that the audience knew I was speaking about the arts, but I was and I needed you to be there. So just before walking to the center of the room from the corner where I had been waiting, I stepped back against the deep sill of the 40-foot high window and reached for the heavy velvet curtains. I imagined them to be <clears throat> not curtains, but rather the hem of your jacket, as if you were standing there ready to accept the weight of my worry if I leaned into you. I felt the gentle pressure of you urging me to stand on my own, insistent that I go. I gathered my notes and walked forward, said your name, told of your dream, spoke to those who would listen and to those who refused. And I thought of Dylan Thomas, Robert Frost, Maya Angelou, Harper Lee, Andre Dubois, Langston Hughes, Grace Paley, Aidan Carruth, County Cullen, Kurt Vonnegut, and you, and how important, how essential it is to speak about the arts as if they matter, because, like shy poets or velvet curtains in stately houses, they do. Thanks. Haiku in Scattered Clouds, the next to last book by Reuben Jackson. And it's very short, so I'll try to uh, speak slowly. Black History Month. Everyone loves your people until March arrives. <laughs> and I think Mary will read a poem that uh, Reuben had printed as a broadside, it's sitting here on the uh, music stand if you want to see it later. Now we have one of our state's greatest poets. Uh, I hope to be our next poet laureate. Uh, I'll just try to leave it at that. I won't say anything snarky about the process. <laughs> but I want to introduce next one of my dearest friends, one of my, you all are my dearest friends and dearest artists. Uh, the great poet, Rajni Evans. Yeah. 
Blessings, one and all. Thank you so much. It's a blessing to be here to honor our brother. I want to share something with you all that he shared. He was always sharing so many gifts with us and um, reminding us of, of our own value and the importance to center ourselves. So this is a something that he shared with me not so long uh, before his passing. Hey there, it's uh, open after six on Thursday, and I hope you're having some quiet time this week, you know, that's something you craved. Uh, this story has no real, there's no therefore, it's just one of these I don't know, funny, that's not the right adjective. It's just a vignette <laughs> I'm sharing with you for you this morning. I was in a coffee shop around the corner from here, and uh, one of my favorite sweatshirts, because it's one of my favorite sweatshirts, it's comfortable, blah, 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 it's, uh, it's like a forest green sweatshirt with Vermont, established 1791 in Green Mountain State. So I go in, get my coffee, find a seat, I live in Catholic University and, you know, people are on break so you can actually find a seat in the morning. No small thing. There's a guy who comes in and I kind of think he's uh, kind of changing lanes, in and out of lanes, in terms of what deportment. And he looks at me, I sit down and looks at me and he says, Vermont, ain't no damn black people in Vermont. Where the fuck you get that sweatshirt? There are no black people in Vermont. And I just say calmly, yeah, there are. You know, I know a good number of people. But then he kind of yells it again, and I realize that this is not really so much about the shirt. He's a bit combative, you know, maybe in crisis, and I think, Wow, just, uh, and I just nodded to him, drank my coffee, and then this family came in and he looked at, he said, I bet your kids are real smart, and the people go the other way. You know, so much stuff happens here, I know other places too, people in crisis, and you never know if something's gonna escalate, but anyway, I just wanted y'all to know, maybe I can add a wee bit of levity here, that I ain't want him to think, you weren't, you weren't there. Y'all weren't there, okay? Much love. Happy New Year. Make some noise for our man. Come on. That's right. And we're still here. I'll share a piece now in, in Ruben's honor. Say Reuben, did a flock of doves spirit away on notes of Sonny Rollins the day you flew home? Did Kelly take a trip to the barber shop and feel a blue melody aching furiously and fiercely, one that made him smile tenderly at the five-year-old getting his hair cut for the first time in the chair across from him? Did whispers of memories only held by chosen rememberers have occasion to rise on scattered clouds across the winds that day, saying, this is honey. Say, Reuben, Reuben, are you somewhere? I know you're somewhere, trailing light across the heavens, walking in that life-size heart of yours, your words tinged with tender, wit and candor, and so much us. Yes, you are somewhere. Bravely breaking tropes in your vivid, unapologetic, shy, and awkward grace. Say, Reuben, I miss my friend. I miss the talks we never had. But it's something like what I told a friend recently. Something about how to lose someone, to lose anything. You had to have had it once. You had to have them first. In this world, don't even know how lucky it was, is we got to have you.
This next piece is called, <laughs> Ain't Nobody Got Time For That. <laughs> I love him because he is such a, a crucial, creative, and witty person and such a, a spiritual practitioner of poetry as a craft. So this actually comes from a, a writing experiment, if you want to try it in your own spare time. It's a, time is a funny bird. Some say it flies, while others say it's kin to money, and still others say it waits for no one. Write a poem in homage to time. What do you use it for? How can it be a friend or an enemy? And what ways will you make it the most useful it can be? Time! What you be doing up there, taking your sweet self to get to me? At times, I wish I could stop you in your tracks. Rewind your long and shorthand manually. Make some more time with Nana and Papa and Mom Eddings. Make you pause so we could really see how magical our childhood was in comparison to the world. I want to sketch your naked body, show you in all your flaws and imperfections, make you stretch yourself to meet my irrational need for you to make more of yourself. I want to sit you down, just us two, and let my inquisitive nature run away with you, like how come, if you wait for no one, the more I live, it seems like you're chasing me down? How come you make the last 10 minutes before the bell rings seem like eons, but let the memories of youth speed like daddies on their way to meet their firstborns? And why you smile with a chipped tooth with a sideways hourglass hanging out? And how come you be looking so deathly scary if I see you too long from my side view? Point blank, why are you so sometimey? I'd be waiting for you in doorways, tracing your footsteps as shadows dance their dance of shortening and lengthening. And time, why are you giving so freely to us as sentences? But seem like you don't want to see us form a sentence to reclaim our rightful throne in the seat of eternity. Time, what's up with that? How come you give cats nine lives and let my cousin get 50 to life? How come some can't keep rhythm to you, still dish you out like they got all the you in the world? I feel like I never really seen your face. Only slivers, shadows, and silhouettes. Pieces of pocket watch and stone-faced grandfather clocks. Cogs, trails, scattered bits of machinery to tell me you've been close. The smell of burning battery, or blood, or something sinister beneath something sweet. Or maybe I'm just overthinking you. After all, you could be innocent. Some wayward child just sent to the market for his mother, trying to get what she had on the list and carrying us all along for the ride. I like to think of you this way, because the other way is scary. Like how you just gave Brother Kamanti some time and you're trying to give him some more. Got me wondering how much time I have left to draw your picture. If you'd even have the kindness or the decency to let me do it justice. I've made a life of finding the poetry between the ticks and talks. A game out of how many times I can dodge a pendulum. My eyes are filled with the years. I never knew it was important to be counted. And now they spill over, flooding my life with millennia. Enough for every child to come to pick up a paintbrush and take it to your face. with a piece uh, honoring our feet people. It's called Beautiful Sun Kiss People. If you know it, sing along. Somebody say, Beautiful Sun Kiss People. Beautiful Sun Kiss People. Walking miracles, unfolding parables, ancient scrolls and ocean's throes. Love be a rose adorning your ears. This morning will not bring mourning or a thorn in tears. This forever moment is shorn of fears. Say, Beautiful Sun Kiss People. We are on the cusp of overthrowing overseers. Light years beyond heckles and jeers. No more tanning our hides nor Dr. Jekyll steers. This love is sheer, transparent and near, as dear as your closest relatives here. Say beautiful sun kiss people. Beautiful sun kiss people. No conversation on us being equal, just entertaining the thought is evil. We weave full, fully woven, lost and frown, traded and stolen, but look what the eye beholding. Say beautiful sun kiss people. Beautiful sun kiss people. Golden. Black and free and ebony, 
mahogany and mocha B, chocolate hogging guys can't see. Rivers running melanin, shallow and monitoring, but most I got it all intents and purposes and sovereign skin. Watch as this your poem ascends, journeying and frolicking. Summer breeze is talking with the autumn wind. How winter just won't break our stride. Too much spring and stuff for us to hide. Our victory is justified. Say beautiful sun kiss people. Beautiful sun kiss people. Solar rise with older ties. Our currency ain't tokenized. We close to those focused and wise whose feet arise in open skies. We, white supremacy eulogizing, blessed ministry new horizon. And desperate attempts at euphemizing our real and feudal lies still will never neutralize. Too many youth have been euthanized. Fed sweet as prey to tooth decay, but truthfully our rootful way has truth to say. Adorns the night, seduce the day, in beauty that the stars obey. Say beautiful sun kiss people. Beautiful sun kiss people. I relate to you so musically, and oh, the joy it brings. Like, please stand if you're able, place your hand on your heart. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies Let it resound loud as the rolling sea Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory. ring in sacred oath, cause after all we are betrothed to wondrous wonders of untold, great grand good fortune that broke the mold, can't buy us off with moldy bread, we've more than crumbs inside our heads, and crust just will not satisfy when banquets are low and our owls divine, we walk and go and make grandma made, delicious is in every shade, say sun-kissed people, say beautiful, blessed, bountiful sun-kissed people. All right, we're gonna get it. <laughs> I praise the path that plants our flag, squarely in earth a self-made basking, a glorious newfound approach that predators cannot encroach, that parasites and wayward folks out of mere glimpse cough and choke. See, this radiance is brighter still than every sun that lights a hill. It calls from something deep within and pours from vocal cords and pen. Say, beautiful sun kiss people. I'm nourished just to see you. You furnish my living room with life abundant killing gloom. You water every plant I have and flourish my gardens green and vast. Sing lullabies to my inner child and soothe all fears of foul defile. You spray me with your sense of grace and lovingly embrace my face. Say I am you and we are race that found in every human trace. Say sun kiss people. Sun kiss people. I wake with your poems on my tongue. In my chest I hear your drum. From my lips I hear your hum. It gets me high and drunk as rum. On you I'm forever spun. Your melanin I'll never shun. Your melanin I'll never shun. <laughs> With you I am forever one. Has there been better? Never one. Say sun kiss people. Sun kiss people. I bequeath these O's to you. Your next of kin and children too. And their children's 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 view will yet still match your vibrant hue. You supernatural sorcery to walk in temples gorgeously, shaming cathedrals far and near, make a white Christ pale in the mirror. <laughs> Sun-kissed children, you are it. 
Don't let nobody tell you, shh. Unless they fertilize the soil. To grow a rose, regal and royal. To don a rose upon a rose of red and black and green and gold. So poetically bestowed, it dignifies your inner throne. Sun-kissed children, marvelous. Miraculous magnificence. Outlandishly so unabashed unapologetic sass, ultra-magnetic blackness, the right goddess on your epitaph. That's blasphemy, surely, right? Because we know true gods never die. Say, sun kiss children, you kiss my eyes with all that sunshine you applying. I say I'm in love with you, because you are me and I am you. From head to toe and all between, I love these princes, kings, and queens. I even find you in my dreams. And when I wake, I vow to breathe, and breathe to vow. Every vowel and consonant I can pronounce. Announce the cosmos all your feats. Build castles for your sweet retreats. Who spell the pillows, black satin sheets. A sacred lounge to rest your crown from all them wounds been crying out. Mm. sun kissed people have no doubt. You're all I am, what I'm about. Can't tell my story without your page. Every chapter be erased. You sew my line so seamlessly. We vibe on higher frequency. R-E-S-P-E-C-G. <laughs> Somebody knows. So let's not love in secrecy. My son kiss people, we be sticky. Make some noise for Ruben one time. Come on, where you at? We love you, Ruben. Carrie, okay, you can do all this. So I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Ask uh, all uh, uh, Ross, all the musicians that have played earlier, Otto, if you'd like to join, and all of us, and poets as well, uh, to join in in a jam. Keith. Jimmy, are you still here? Yes. Oh. I was uh, thinking about this this morning and I was promising myself to not say anything because all these amazing poets with their wordsmith have got that genre and skill set down. But as a musician, as a music educator, just as a person, what brings us all together and what Ruben brought us together with his music and his voice every time I would hear it in my kitchen. Um, so on that note, the universal language of music to be this connective force for all of us on such a fragile planet is an honor to be here. So any other players that are still here, please come on up.
Gentlemen, thank you for all being here. And Tucson.
Okay, that was such a tease. Uh, that was wonderful. Give a big round of applause for all the music. You know, I'm sure all of you have noticed, but as I've been watching this, you know, beautiful photo, and from what I understand, this was either the last or one of the last photos Ruben sent. But as we've been sitting here, his grin has been getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> I know this. And, and you notice that, uh, that raised eyebrow? That was very much about Ruben. He was no joke. He was very much aware. That was one of the things I so loved about Ruben. Um, as many of you have said, as Alan, as, as you mentioned, um, he was such an ally, um, such a beautiful ally in the truest, warmest, sweet potato pie <laughs> sense of ally, uh, a, 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 a real brother. Uh, not in the popular colloquial sense, but a, a, a real brother, comrade. Uh, one of the things that so impressed me about Ruben, uh, and I knew someone years ago in San Francisco uh, who had a similar thing, but Ruben loved to read music scores as, as a generally not practicing musician. He loved to read music scores and was completely literate musically, you know, theoretically. And uh, I was so impressed with that. So uh, next we have Jeff Gavalt. Uh, we'll talk about his experiences with Ruben. Thank you. Try something a little different though. I want everybody to stand up for just a moment. Say with me, we've got three words you can master. The first is I. You can say it loud and proud as Ruben would say. I. I. school student, and this 13-year-old girl 
high school student decided to leave Ruben a comment. And she said, I love this poem, Ruben. I love the rhythm of your language, the spareness of your images. I think you have great potential. <laughs> and I couldn't wait to tell Ruben. So for years, I introduced Ruben in classrooms on, on shows or events or whatever as the man with great potential. <laughs> And the thing is, is that Reuben lived his potential. And Reuben respected potential, which is why he got along so well with kids. I don't know, I'm here to represent a different part of Reuben, I think. Reuben as a teacher. And he was extraordinary because he saw the potential in people who others had given up on, or maybe they had given up on themselves, but not after a dose of root. And what he got the kids to produce, because he showed them and gave them respect, and he listened, and he sincerely appreciated their words, their imagination, and the risks they took by showing themselves through their words. So I was blessed to drive all over friggin' Vermont with Reuben Jackson, in which I learned some things that I'll never repeat. <laughs> but it was truly an honor. And when he died, I was a mess. I finally had to go out and weed the garden. And it was March in Vermont. How do you weed a garden in March in Ver Vermont? But there was no snow. And finally I realized that all I had lost was the future. my future time with Reuben. And I don't know, it was the strangest thing. It was almost like Reuben was coming down to say, think about all of those times we were together. Think about all of the experiences we had. Embrace it. Embrace the past. Embrace what he taught us how he elevated our lives, and how he elevated so many kids. Because the other thing that happened when he died was I started getting all these emails from kids. Now, I can still call them kids, but they're not kids anymore, saying how sad they were. So I thought I would share three of them with you and leave you with their words. So Anna wrote, Reuben and I maintained correspondence long past our time at Young Writers Project. In high school, he changed the way I thought about music and poetry. Really changed the way my brain worked around those things. Later, he helped inspire my choice to go to graduate school. I'm really, really going to miss him. I'm so grateful to you for bringing him into my life. These were Aaron's thoughts. I gasped when I heard the news, and I've spent the last two mornings listening to his Jazz Hour archives. I and so many of the writers have vibrant core memories of getting to share a writing piece with Ruben. His workshops have had such a lasting impact on my writing and relationship to music, and I will treasure him. 
hearing him speak a line of your work that resonated with him? As a young person, that was pure magic. Pure magic. This is an immense loss. And finally, Bridget. I'm so lucky to have known Reuben. He had an incredible voice, both spoken and written. And he was a gifted communicator in his many meetings. He was such a constant in my life at YWP, and when we later moved, both moved away from Vermont online, he never stopped teaching. A glance at his Facebook feed can tell you that. Reuben lit up the room, not like lightning, but like a lantern, soft and warm and steady, both guide and destination, a companion on the road. He tried to disguise his brilliance with humility, he never quite succeeded. <laughs> he wrote about loneliness and community, about loss and friendship and love, about revolution, about family, about music and art. He had a gift for distilling, distilling experience into something truthful and surprising. When I learned he was gone, my first rejection, reaction, no joke, was, I wonder what Ruben thinks of all this. I want to read what he has to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, and now we have another great poet, uh, one of our great Vermont poets, Mary Elder Jacobs. And it was about friendships in life and how they can have so many ranges. They're like times, like the five second friendship of the person that you just wave to once when you're crossing a street. Or the five minute friendship of, um, you know, your postal carrier who you do talk to, like regularly. Um, or the cashier clerk at the checkout line. Um, and then on and on and then your family friendships and then lifelong friends. And um, compared to many people in this room, you know, I knew Ruben very little. Um, but I first encountered him in 2016 in a, you know, in a way that wasn't just hearing him on the radio, I guess. I had heard him on the radio. Um, and Poem City was going on. And Rachel Seneschal told me that Kelly McMahon um, Letterpress, uh, Mayday at Letterpress Studio was looking to do something for um, Poem City and you know what I like to talk with her. And so anyway, she had this great idea of Poets Pulling Prints, it was called, that she had seen in California where poets gave readings and um, broadsides were designed and when people came to the readings, the, the people that were at the readings could crank the press and the broadside would come out, um, and then the poets would sign them, and you know, so that was the idea. So I was gonna read, and Kelly said, so but who else? And um, I guess the other thing I wanna say is that sometimes we, all of us, many of us are giving gifts into the world that we don't even know we're giving. 
And I know that Ruben knew that he was giving gifts because people would compliment him or thank him for his radio show, for example. Um, and when I would hear it, I could hear him talking to the person who might have just finished their long week of work or might be sitting down to a romantic dinner. Um, but in 2016, I would be driving home from my high school son's robotics meeting <laughs> where I was a chaperone and robotics was not my thing. I had an art and writing background, but I gave myself to that because that was his passion. And then driving home on a Friday night after three hours of robotic tinkering, Ruben would be on. And I would just be like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so in 2016, I thought with Kelly, like, maybe we could ask. I knew his voice from the radio. It was so beautiful. And then I found out he wrote poetry. And I thought of asking him, but I was completely beyond humbled you know, intimidated to ask him. And then someone said, well, what have you got to lose? You know, he'll just, if he says no. And then I didn't know him, and so I wrote him an email, which I wish I still had, but, you know, emails change. I don't have that anymore. Um, and I asked him, and I said, I don't know you, but I know your voice, and would you meet, you know, with me? And, and he said yes. And I emailed Kelly, and he said yes! Um, so George, was there and George was referencing this broadside in the frame that's George is right there um, and so I just thought I would read Ruben's broadside from that night um, which Kelly uh, she did linoleum block prints of um, snowflakes and a couple different colors you can see it kind of ranging and um, so this is signed by Ruben I remember the evening being so busy there's a space to plug in what number of how many prints were done and that's not written in because everybody was too busy and chatting but this poem i just realized was sam talking ahead of time is in the new book but it's called eastbury in the book and i guess ruben some had, had different you know versions of different poems but so and i think raj did we mention vignettes um Ruben in his work, he often strikes me just being such a witness to a moment. And, um, and, you know, he had an ear for music, but he also had an ear for dialogue, like listening to people. Um, so anyway, this is called Barry. As in Barry, Vermont. Barry, the sales clerk claimed the snow fell with a Vermont accent. <laughs> I only knew that the cords I bought from L.L. Bean had not been purchased in vain, and that here no one fought in order to snare the last roll of toilet paper from an otherwise empty shelf. The latter was reason enough to call my southern kin, whose minds were also filled with central casting notions of the world above Boston. But the winter owned my eyes like the gazebo where I wept, waiting for Jimmy Stewart's ghost. host of the show of Bamat Mamon on WTTR. Ruben and I have a lot in common as DJs, as educators, and as, uh, as uh, social commentators. I really always appreciated his wry take on things. And, Last time I saw him read here, he read a poem about, uh, about uh, the Dudley store. And there were two black fellows in the back of the store in the 1960s 
looking at the Triscuits and the peanut butter and jelly and the way everybody in the store was looking at them, they thought they were back there planning a revolution. <laughs> um, Jeff and Ruben were at the Young Writers Conference uh, workshop at um, the Burlington Writers Conference. Uh, and I walked into an auditorium to see what was going on because I'm an export uh, from, from the live free or die state. I came to the freedom and unity state. Um, and Ruben was in there with about 230 kids and he had them in the palm of his hand saying a line that he loved, um, giving praise and talking about missed opportunities in the poems for young writers, and it was just amazing. Um, I got to pinch hit. He was sick at one point in time during Poem City, and I got to pinch hit for him on a presentation he had promised Rachel Seneschal about Joni Mitchell. And I got, thanks to his absence, a whole course for myself in Joni Mitchell. Um, she was an ambassador from like the north of Canada who came and spread her music and ideas around the world. And he also was a scholar of Duke Ellington, who was a jazz ambassador and a, a jazz educator and uh, a social commentator. So I think Rubin, in some ways, was an anthropologist who reported out in poetry. He was a pioneer being here and showing up here regularly. I also grew up in a multicolored family. Um, I have an adopted black sister by um, adoption. My mom worked for the NAACP in the 1960s in Boston. and. Uh, um, my little sister was adopted and it changed my life forever because I felt fiercely protective of her and especially in white spaces it was really tricky to see other people treating her in ways that were just either scary or enraging or what have you. Um, this is a little story about that, sort of. I was physically scared to live and teach in Missouri, and I really wasn't sure why I had such strong feelings about it. And then it dawned on me, everything I knew about Missouri, I had learned from Mark Twain. When I was 10, reading The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, I come from a multicolored, multicultural family. My dad was a Brooklyn Jew who married a Westport wasp, and in 1966, they adopted a little black and white girl. It was illegal for blacks and whites to marry in Massachusetts at that point in time, and it would be for a couple more years. We had a family meeting to talk about what we would name our new little sister. We did not usually gather for stuff like this, and so I figured this is a big deal, getting a sister, naming her. It was first grade, I'd been chasing a little girl on the playground named Nancy. She had red hair and was really fast, and I loved her very much, and I thought Nancy would be a great name, but my family outvoted me. I needed my brother to at least tie it up, and four-year-olds are unreliable. The vote went three to one in favor of meeting Susan, and when we got my sister, her name, given name, was Nancy. She is now Nancy Susan. We were from New Hampshire, Brookline, New Hampshire. My mother and dad lived in town for six years and my mom was part of the PTA. My dad elected to the school board. They played bridge and poker, and games of the day. They were from away in a land of folks where 10 generations were in the ground. Most couple with two or three kids were 22. My folks were 40 and 42. Everyone thought they were our grandparents. We moved to New Hampshire, from New Hampshire to Boston for a couple of years so my mom could work for the NAACP. Integration in Boston schools was not going so well and busing was a fiasco. And my mom's decision to adopt was part age, part rage, and part surrender. She was not going to be able to clean up the mess of Boston's racial politics, but she could change the life of at least one person. She and my dad chose my sister to give it a try. 
and we moved back to New Hampshire with a new family member. When I was in Missouri, I heard a 90-year-old black psychologist, Elliot Battle, tell the story of integrating Columbia, Missouri schools. He and his wife were hired to run the black school in town when a group of well-meaning progressive white folks talked him into moving his family to their neighborhood in order to integrate the elementary school. This man's 65-year-old daughter was there, and although she was super proud of her dad, she made it abundantly clear she was drafted. She did not sign up to be integrator in chief. She was, she, her dad said, yep, she was a pioneer. I think Reuben was a pioneer. I realized in that instant my sister was a pioneer too. She single-handedly integrated Brookline all those years ago. She had no plan, no agenda. She had a big smile, a runny nose, a penchant for peanut butter and fluff. She was sweet, mischievous, snored like a buzzsaw. We got a little red wagon to pull her around in. My dad was no longer invited to some of the poker games and he had to leave poker for bridge. He never rejoined the school board. Then my mom was no longer speaking to the school nurse, and we didn't play with her kids anymore, and then some teenagers didn't babysit for us anymore. My mom's plan was to send us off into the world, a youthful mod squad, one black, one white, one blonde. She sent the three of us off fundraising, selling raffle tickets for the NAACP in the little red wagon. We took turns pulling each other up and down hills of our little town, Resting a hill to ride down the next, we rode like tobogganers wrapped around each other. I was the oldest, I got to steer. We had a spiel, we had change, we had sharp pencils. Chance to buy a ticket for some long forgotten prize, a dollar a piece, six for five bucks. We did have a couple of slam doors. My mom coached us, just roll along. Say your pleases and thank yous. Remain polite, remain calm. We rang a few bells, knocked on some doors, had a few no answers, even though we knew folks were home. To Brookline's credit, we mostly got invited in. We sat politely on coaches and answered questions. Yes, she was our new sister. Yes, she was adopted. Yes, we had lived in town before. Yes, we took African drum lessons in Boston on Wednesdays. Yes, we knew what the NAACP stood for. Would you like to buy a raffle ticket? Thank you. You could be a winner. Maybe we could all win. It's 1969. Nancy seemed nonplussed by all of this. It's hard to rattle a four-year-old pioneer in a new land. She was bold and quick and cheerful. She ran a mean 25-yard dash. She laughed easily, told the world her stories, chortled sang herself to sleep. She hugged fiercely and well, whether you're young or old, short or tall, ready or not. I still remember the first Saturday I met her. It was a Sunday, a late spring morning. The emerald green grass in the yard was lush. We were being introduced. My folks brought her home for the first time. Nancy lay on a plaid wool blanket spread on the grass, punctuated by thousands of golden dandelions, not yet turned to fluff. The dandelion I offered her shone in the sun, contrasted against her black skin and simple white cotton diaper. She stuck it in her mouth and began to chew. In several days, in the backyard, I begin using all those dandelions to make wishes. <laughs> My elementary school teacher in third or fourth grade knew I had a heavy load as my little sister's ambassador. And she said, I want you to take this poem and learn it and recite it. Practice not crying. <laughs> I was telling Sam about her, I want you to learn this poem and share it with the class. Um, it's a poem by Langston Hughes, and I'd love to teach it to you if you'd like to learn. It goes, it's called Motto, and I had a motto after this, and it was a poem in me. I play it cool and dig all jive. That's the reason I stay alive. 
My motto as I live and learn is dig and be dug in return. Want to try it? I play it cool and dig all jive. That's the reason I stay alive. My motto as I live and learn is dig and be dug in return. And that was my introduction to black poetry. I had been a Winnie the Pooh and a Milne guy before that, and I have never looked back. Thanks for being so generous. And thank you all. some folks before we close out tonight. Uh, we do have a reception downstairs, so please don't leave. We have food and cupcakes, so that should be enough to set cupcakes. A book. And a book. And a book. Of course it's a book. Um, hello. Um, so I wanted to thank Orca Media. Thank you so much for connecting us. Thank you. We are not only recording, we are live streaming, so I'm looking straight into the camera to folks who are watching right now um, from probably around the country and many folks in D.C. Uh, Janae is watching as well. I want to just say thank you so much to everyone for everything you've done for the D.C. celebration that happened in March. If you folks tuned into that, um, it was wonderful. Uh, we base our celebration on what happened in D.C. because why? Why would you redo something that was so brilliant and was so Ruben and it was jazz in, in real time? That is jazz in real time. Um, so thank you so much to all of those folks that are watching and thank you Orca for being here. Uh, and thank you for Coach Spieler for their support with the PA. Uh, we couldn't have done it without them, yes, thank you. And, and thank you, of course, to Vermont Humanities and to the Arts Council and to Catamount Arts and to Jacob and to Sant um, for designing this and to all the folks who said, yes, I will be involved. Um, I'm looking at all of you. Thank you very much for, for doing this. I knew you would. <laughs> I'm so glad. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And, and one last thing. I, I didn't want to say anything too personal up here. I wanted to keep my... my um, stage management hat on, looking at Jody, he said, don't do that. I said, watch me do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna stay professional and not say anything. But I wanna just say this. Uh, Ruben came into my life at a time when I needed him. Uh, that's probably your story too. And we didn't connect on music. We didn't connect on poetry. We connected on humanity. And when he, when I, I heard from him just hours before he went on his last radio show. We spoke every single day. And when he died, I thought, there's no way that I'm going to process this. So I put it away. And I planned an event with my friends. That's how I've dealt with it. Um, but I feel now that what he, he was always so humble. And we always connected on the point that, or the, the feeling that we just always had to ask for legitimacy to even be in the space and to breathe the air that we breathe and we would talk about that often he was so humble because and he loved people so much and he supported them so much because he felt the pain of not being supported listened to or um, just feeling that he had the right to be on the earth which is a really tough feeling to have as a person but it's what made him so beautiful because he did not want anyone else to feel that way. And he didn't do it as a, it wasn't his mission, it was just who he was. And so all of you, I know, have benefited from that and will do so going on into the future. And I, I will cut, cut this short. And his beautiful humanity, which I had to shut out after he died, um, I was able to process here because it's not just about one human, it's humanity and it's all of us and I just saw him reflected in every single one of you and now I see a fuller picture of Reuben Jackson that I can hopefully 
leave here today in the process. So thank you everyone for coming out and doing that together. And one last big thank you to Jacob, of course, who's downstairs preparing food. And I want to give a huge thank you, I keep saying thank you, but a bucket's load of gratitude to my dear friend Toussaint, who stepped right up. Toussaint, you took this on without hesitation and led the festivities, and I couldn't think of a better person to have done that for us today. And I appreciate you so much, and I think it is fitting to go out on Toussaint's work and he's going to share his art with you. So again, thank you, and please welcome Toussaint back to the stage as an artist and musician and poet himself. Fire. Yeah. Fire. Uh, my book launch will be a 
be even more than five. <laughs> and then all the kids will be saying, <laughs> Okay. So, uh, I'm going to do a piece, totally improvisational, uh, called Cosmographies.
Elizabeth to come down. Um, please feel free to go downstairs and just have a good time. And uh, please continue supporting your poets and musicians. And by all means, listen to jazz. Yeah.